Hello, everyone. My guest today is Peter Mahoney. He's the founder and CEO of Plana and has more than 30 years experience in technology, marketing, development, and general management. Peter has run businesses up to $650 million in annual revenue and has been the top marketing executive for companies from startup phase to multi-billion dollar public companies. Peter, you ready to take us to the top? I am ready, Nathan. Let's go. All right. This is Plana, P-L-A-N-N-U-H.com with that good old Boston accent, right? That's exactly correct. Well done. <laughs> What's the company doing? How do you guys make money? Well, we sell a marketing, planning, and budgeting platform, uh, and we make money by licensing uh, this to companies from very small companies up to departments of large enterprises uh, in with annual license contracts. Okay, interesting. So when you use the word license, I want to make sure I'm clear. You're, you're going direct to consumer. You're not going through credit. Yeah, yeah. There's no value added. You're not. In other words, you're not white labeling it to agencies, and then the agencies are licensing it to end customers. You have the direct relationship. That's exactly right. It's a it's a classic SaaS direct to customer, uh, and the customer is anyone from a uh, relatively small size company all the way up to. I mean, we have Michelin. You know, a small department of Michelin in Australia uses our software. And this, it looks like it's hyper focused on marketing budget. Is that right? That's exactly right. Very specifically on marketing because they have some very unique. Actually, that's uh, not correct. There's no such thing as very unique. They have unique requirements for the way that they uh, they plan their uh, their budget and spend. Well, we'll learn more. But I was going to one of my first questions was going to be this is a very competitive space. You know, zero is growing extremely fast. There's a lot of companies in the space. But but you have hyper focused on one specific expense line item. And I'm sure that's giving you a competitive advantage where others might see a weakness. That, that's right. In fact, uh, budgeting in general may be a relatively crowded space. Marketing budgeting is not. Uh, and uh, because it's very specialized, uh, and, and in fact, I was the CMO of a company called Nuance, a $2 billion voice recognition leader. I went out to look for solutions and there was very, very little out there. There were some very high end, very expensive things, uh, but nothing that was what I expected to see, which was more like a typical SaaS model, like a Slack or an Asana that I could just start and get going for cheap and easy and, and grow from there. Uh, so I saw a huge uh, opening in the market for doing that. That's why we built Planet. That's great. Okay, so what is cheap and easy? What's the average kind of company paying you per month to use the tool? Yeah, so right now we've just launched at the end of December. I mean, okay. the very end of December. I think <laughs> the 28th was the first paying customer. Of 2018, uh, so right? Of 2018, exactly. Uh, so there are 18 customers so far. The average annual revenue right now is about uh, 2700 2765 to be precise. Okay, uh, and you're selling that all up front? Pretty significantly. In fact, if you look at the last five, it's more like 4500 Okay, that's great. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Peter. So are you selling that full $2,700 per year contract? They're paying it all up front or they're paying about 230 bucks a month monthly? All up front. All oh. up front, cash up front. That's great. Okay, so 18 folks at that rate, you just passed about kind of four, call it four grand in monthly recurring revenue, something like that? Yeah, exactly. And we we think ARR, but obviously translate to MRR. Sure. It's, uh, it's about 4K. It's uh, ARR is, uh, you know, 49.50, just under $50,000. I love that you're so comfortable coming on talking about those numbers because most people, especially if they've come from a place where they're like, listen, Nathan, I've run a multi-billion dollar company. Don't don't grill me on my freaking 40,000 bucks in ARR right now. But everyone has to start from nothing, right? Dude, Nathan, this is your show. I, I'm a listener, of course. <laughs> oh, you listen. I love that. I love that. That's great. So tell me, tell me real quick, because uh, I want to get in your head a bit. You you run like massive companies before. So what like life event happened where you said, you know what, I want to get back and dig in the weeds and put on my Patagonia, you know, sweatshirt and go at it again. So I, I it's like always wanted to do this, Nathan. And, uh, and it's been way too long. In fact, I'm, I'm the son of an entrepreneur. And unfortunately, uh, my dad died a few years ago before he could see me do this. I wish I did this first because uh. he'd be thrilled to participate in it. Uh, and, and I always wanted to do it. I always had an excuse and I had the perfect opportunity. I had a 13 year, very successful career at, at Nuance. Uh, it was very good for me and it was the right opportunity to, uh, to, to take the plunge and, and do it. I couldn't come up with any more excuses. So what year was that? When did you take the plunge? When did you write the first line of code? Uh, so 2017, April of 2017 is when we incorporated the company. Okay. And where are you at today in terms of team size? So we've got five full-time people right now. We've got a couple of part-timers uh, and then we've got a team of seven in Ukraine uh, doing the hands-on keyboard coding. 
Okay, so five full time and then seven contractors in Ukraine. Yep. Okay, so call maybe 12 there total. How did you spend a lot of companies when they're launching? They've heard about these big cost savings in Ukraine and Argentina and some places in India, but they go, I don't know anyone over there. How can I spin up a dev team? How did you do it? How did you find your point person in Ukraine? It it was an interesting journey. So we actually started with a team in India uh, and uh, we found them through a local connection here in Boston that we had some experience with and they were great for our early stage. But then when we needed to start to really harden and and get the system ready for a different kind of scale, uh, because this is a system that's gonna need to support a lot of of users that's intended to be quite a large scale system, and we need the right sort of privacy and security stance. Uh, We needed a different level of team, uh, and our head of engineering uh, was the head of engineering for uh, a team called, uh, a company called Jibo, uh, that made the, the, uh, the robot uh, uh, sort yeah. of an emotional robot thing. Great experience with this company we had in the Ukraine. So that was our reference in, and that's how we found them. Interesting. Okay, very cool. Now, how have you funded this? Are you bootstrapped or have you raised? So we've raised some cash. Uh, we've raised uh, about $2 million to date, uh, via, all via a convertible note. Uh, it's primarily angels, including me. I'm our biggest angel. <laughs> that's uh, the best and, place to be. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we've got two uh, Boston-based VCs who've got sort of small placeholder checks in this uh, Glasswing Ventures and Accomplice. Okay, very good. And and um, okay, Glasswing Accomplice. Uh, did either of them have to like lead the convertible loan, or did you did you lead because you took you know the majority of it? Yeah, I I did it first. You so just set the terms. I, I set the terms up front, uh, and then they begrudgingly joined me. <laughs> very good. All right. And then obviously, it sounds like you just launched. So revenue twelve months ago was zero. Can't really calculate a growth rate at the, yet at this point. You're too early. That's exactly right. Unfortunately, we can't uh, we can speculate, but that wouldn't be too useful. Yeah. Tell me how a company like yours um, thinks about kind of onboarding and churn and how strong is your bucket? You know, you don't have a big enough cohort yet. Right. To really have like gross churn and expansion revenue data. But you still have to think about keeping customers and getting them activated. So how do you balance that? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, it was an interesting journey, Nathan, because when we started, the original thesis was we wanted to go out really wide and have a real uh, freemium model because we thought it would be great to have lots and lots of people because this is a data play for us. My CTO is a data scientist. The idea is to build sort of AI based recommendations to, to not only build the plan, but actually help people understand what they should do with their plan. Uh, and so we originally said, let's go out in a freemium model. Uh, we decided that one, the product wasn't quite ready to be magical to get people up and running and, and do that coaching up front. So we decided to focus uh, on uh, on really getting sort of the paid customers up and running and successful. Uh, and, and to do that, we provide uh, we provide uh, onboarding services to, to get people up and running. So we we white glove them everything from we take all their data, we set up their budget, we train them, we do all these things. Uh, we initially did that for free uh, and, and we're now uh, moved to, uh, to charge for that. So it's a thousand dollar charge to get people up and running. Uh, with with the system and and people are are happy to pay that because we not only provide the services but we actually give them some expert advice on what they what their budget is you know yeah. what are they are they doing the right kinds of things so it's it's a super valuable service for them to get up and running well you, the price point you've chosen is a tricky one so when I look at I, I've interviewed about mm, I want to say maybe twenty four CEOs that have more than a hundred million bucks in ARR and you obviously have run a company at you know way north of that as well but when I looked at the data around pricing the average ACV of those guys there was no one yeah you know the gap right so like how do you now, maybe you could say, well, Nathan, we're early, so it's okay for us to play in that gap where ACVs are between 500 bucks and five grand, but you're putting a lot of touch on those things. And, and at some point, you either have to go up more or down more. What is, how do you figure that out? When's, when's the timing right? Yeah, so we're, we're absolutely going up. Uh, yeah. And we're going to go up as we uh, deliver more value in the product. In fact, from we started the first few customers, they they were $1,000 ACV. The largest ones to date are about 9,600 is the largest. Uh, and, and we expect our ACV at the end of the year is going to be you know, somewhere between uh, $7,000 and $8,000 yep. based on our current projections. Yeah, so and you're moving up pretty rapidly. To, yeah. And in fact, we've raised our prices twice already 
uh, in, in the first period of time because we were super early at the beginning. We're trying to iterate very quickly. Uh, and as we deliver more value to our customers, uh, they're willing to pay us more. And, yeah. uh, and that's that's been a good model because we absolutely believe the uh, that sweet spot of revenue. We use HubSpot as our model. Uh, and HubSpot is uh, they, they're about a ten thousand dollar average customer value per year, uh, and and we think we'll probably be a little bit north of that with the, the approach that we're taking. Uh, but uh, we're we're not going to be a hundred thousand dollars because we want an inexpensive velocity based sales team. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, do you have anyone on the, on your team right now that is sales focused? Yes. Yeah, we just hired our first sales rep, which is super exciting. Uh, he started about six weeks ago. He's already drawn his first blood, meaning that he not only put something in the pipeline, but took it back out and, and, and sold his first contracts uh, within the first six weeks. So, That's amazing. Uh, so it's it, yeah, getting that first non-founder led sale is really important. Yeah, Peter. Yeah, that is a critical moment. So like there's a lot of, you know, some people like Matt at Yesware, who's also up there in your neck of the woods would argue in a New York Times piece that the best, you know, you don't want to hire your first sales rep until the founder has closed at least a million bucks in AR, him or herself. Um, the, the flip side to that is, hey, let's get started now, throw them in and kind of you're going to build a pro, you're going to learn about a pro forma that you think might be accurate for salesperson onboarding through this first guy you've and you'll edit it based off what he does. Is that kind of how you're thinking about it? It is. In fact, I got a great piece of advice from David uh, Cancel, who's the CEO of Drift. Uh, and, and David said to me, he kicks himself every time he says, "I'm gonna next time I'm going to hire my first sales rep even earlier. Uh, and, and I think it's a really important, uh, really important to get the understanding of what that sales motion and that sales process looks like as early as, as possible. Uh, and uh, because that helps us that helps us figure out how to build uh, real scale into the product very early. Uh, so that's that's what we're that's what we're focused on at this point. And, and it's been amazingly helpful. I also found that while there are great things that a, a, a founder and CEO can do has great value in the sales process. This 29 year old sales rep is amazing and he's teaching me things already. Uh, I started my career in sales and, and apparently it was a very long time ago because he's much better than I am. At it. <laughs> That's funny. All right. And, and talk me through the first 10 customers. I mean, how'd you find them? Where were you hustling? What, was, what, what are the weird things you did to land them? Yeah. So the, we started with this idea that we could build build opportunity from uh, from digital marketing uh, because we thought that that was the way to build scale, like build uh, prospects in. There's a huge market. Basically, every marketer, uh, every marketing organization uses a spreadsheet to plan with the exception of a handful of hundreds of people. Literally, it's the penetration of, of purpose built systems is very low in this marketplace. Mm -hmm. So it's a wide open market. So we're trying to prove the thesis that we can identify opportunity through digital marketing and content marketing kind of approach. The first 10, uh, four of them were people in my personal network because I've got a great personal network, in, especially in the Boston area, but in, uh, in marketing people in general. Six of them, though, are people that we got through digital marketing. I mentioned Michelin. They found us through a, 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 a AdWords ad. Uh, there are some other people who found us through Instagram. I, I mean, it's, it's been uh, from very early on, we wanted to prove that we could put people into the pipeline and get them through uh, through those kinds of techniques uh, to, uh, to to grow the business. And what are some it. AdWords you're bidding on? So it's it's marketing budget software, marketing planning software are the the key ones that we look at. Interesting. And I mean, how did you come up around those? How did you pick those? Like, in other words, I mean, I, it might sound obvious, but you want to make sure obviously there's enough search volume where someone's going to see it, but also not enough com competition where the, the cost per clicks are through the roof. Yeah, in fact, and we do a lot with negative keywords as an example to to make sure that so we're 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 not a, a media planning tool. Uh, we're a total marketing budget tool, so we want a census view of the whole budget. In fact, we know great things because we can get a full view. We can tell people strategy by looking at their budget, as an example. Uh, a lot of people thought early on that we're a media planning tool, so we did a lot of experimentation uh, with the AdWords tools that are quite robust. Uh, to help us hone down on a set of words, we've we've got uh, about 50 different variations right now that we're we're running. But the high runners are, are sort of the obvious ones 
uh, around marketing budget software, marketing budget, marketing planning. And how do you, Peter, in these early days, how do you manage something like burn, right? So you have two million in the company and most of that is your money. What, I mean, how comfortable, how aggressive are you being in these early days to build? Yeah, it's a it's an important balance, of course, because uh, to some people, two million dollars sounds like a lot of money. It isn't uh, because, as you know, you can go through that quickly. Yep. One way we manage burn is we don't pay me. Yeah, uh, so that's that's a way to manage things. But there are real costs. I mean, I've got real employees, uh, so we're we we our opex uh, monthly is is a about 100K, Mm -hmm. uh, but we also start to bring in cash. I mean, the nice thing about an annual license model is the fact that you have, when you close a deal, uh, you bring in the cash up front, even though you recognize the revenue ratably over the the first year period. So it's a, it's a good model, but at the same time, we have to strike the balance. And, and there are times that I want to do more uh, and and I want to step my foot on the accelerator, but we do a lot of testing and small sets to really understand are we doing the right thing before we start to uh, to put more fuel in, into the fire. And we're we're at raising more money now. I mean, yeah. we're, our our hope is to raise another half million or so, uh, and and we've done that really successfully along the way via angels, and that will help us accelerate our customer acquisition. And then we think, you know, within the next year, we'll be ready for our first priced round. So gross burn, total OPEX, negative kind of a hundred grand per month. It sounds like net burn, maybe 90 grand per month, something like that, because you have a couple annuals coming in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that's great. The the extra, so let me ask you another question. In order to preserve equity, um, have you looked at raising or doing things and leveraging venture debt? Or are you, would you say too early to, to look at those options? I wanted to keep us debt free as as long as we possibly could. Uh, and uh, so we, we've looked at and considered some different kinds of uh, financing options. We wanted to be as plain vanilla understandable as possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so one of the things I did, for instance, on my uh, with my investment, I'm in the same note that all my investors are. And I like that because we're at parity. Uh, we we have uh, aligned self interests. Uh, with with our investors, which I think is an important uh, uh, approach to do. And, and we want to make sure that we're just we're going to be a really clean investment uh, for for that first priced equity round. Yeah. And no, I mean, I guess the reason I ask is just because if you are looking to preserve equity and you have identified a keyword that works for you, it becomes very easy to just play an arbitrage game on an interest rate on loan money and keep all your equity. Uh, but it's you're right, though. It is, you know, many would argue if you're just going to if you're already committed to the VC route and you want to stay, quote unquote, clean, just sticking to these simple terms is also beneficial. Yeah, we're also. I'm I'm in this to build a big company, Nathan. This isn't this isn't about growing something that's going to be you know ten million, twenty million dollars uh, in in ARR. The goal is to make this hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, we've got a big enough market to do it. With that in mind, I'm expecting that we are going to take some dilution on to to get to that size. But we're going to grow big enough so that who cares about the dilution at the end of the day? If yeah. The, if, It's tricky though, Peter. I don't know if you look at the statistics, but when you look at the last 24 SaaS IPOs, the average founder, right, on these venture back things had about 6% equity at the end. So the argument would be, yeah, but that's fine. It's a billion dollar pie. And that's cool. It's just a a lot of people, I think, underestimate how, what that dilution actually looks like to put, you know, CrowdStrike is about to go public, right? They've raised 300 million bucks to get 300 million in ARR. The founder is obviously hyper diluted, but it's a much bigger pie now. So it just depends on what you want. I, I'm actually pretty good at math, Nathan. I have degrees in physics and computer science. And uh, so I understand the way the metrics work. I, I think that it is an important consideration. There's always a balance. What I don't want to do is I don't want to starve the company. Uh, and uh, and I believe to take full advantage of the opportunity, uh, we're going to need to uh, we're going to need to raise some some reasonable cash to do that. Uh, and and I'm completely going in it uh, eyes wide open. Uh, we know uh, how to uh, watch for uh, watch for the terms that are going to uh, cause us trouble uh, down the road. Not only for me, but for uh, my early investors uh, are important for me to protect. Yeah, no, I get that. I, and and I, wasn't, I wasn't hitting your math skills either, by the way. I was just setting a very <laughs> obvious figure, which most people tell themselves the same story you just told yourself, but they don't actually realize the amount of dilution it's going to take to build, I'm quoting you, a company with hundreds of millions of dollars in ARR. And that's why I'm asking you is, do, have you seen, because see, you've been on both sides of the coin, right? You've been a much bigger company. Do you have some trick that we should be aware of where you can actually preserve for the founder 20, 30% equity at IPO time or whenever you hit hundred million bucks in ARR without, I mean, there hasn't been anyone that's been able to do that. 
Yeah, I don't think there's a single magical trick, by the way. If okay, there was, so that, then oh, everybody would do that's it. That's why I posed uh, the question, by the way. Yeah, no, uh, and uh, if you hear one, please let me know and no one else. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so there, there isn't one single thing. I, I think it's about careful management of uh, of of the company, of uh, your fundraising approach, uh, and, uh, and, and preserving as much as you can every single, single step of the way. It's part of the reason that we, we've been uh, strategic about the way that we want to time our first priced equity round. Uh, we want to make sure that we sort of set that stake in the ground appropriately uh, and, and, and make sure that because setting us off in the right uh, for that first round is really critical to make sure that we're sort of setting the setting the terms appropriately uh, and uh, making sure that we actually have provable, scalable momentum in the company. That's going to help us, we believe, in, in getting that first ba- base set of terms, uh, it, which is why I, I believe that it's about defining the process and systems and for, for repeatability, running the experiments at this early stage, proving to myself first, because I'm a big investor in the company, obviously, if I can prove to myself that we have the right kind of scalability, I can. I think I can make the right investment thesis that will help me protect as much as I can. And again, if, if, if I have 20, 30 percent, I mean, that would be a home run for me. Uh, if, if I had, that'd be unbelievable. Pete, if you held, if you built a 150 million or North million dollar company, you still had 20 or 30%. That'd be obviously great. Yeah. Yeah, of course it would. <laughs> yeah, of course that would be fantastic. And, and at the end of the day, uh, I, I believe that there's, I, I believe that we can, uh, do a good job preserving the right amount of uh, equity. I think it's probably not going to be that much at the end of the day that I'm going to own. Remember, I'm, I'm a uh, I'm a single founder, so that helps, uh, right? So uh, so I started with a lot more equity, and that's one way to to help protect is is start with a, a bigger piece of the pie. Yeah, very good. Let's wrap up here with the famous five. Number one, favorite business book. So my favorite business book is a blog. Uh, is Kel Blog by Dave Kellogg. I don't know if you know him, but awesome SaaS. Post mentioned. analytics. If you have to force me into a book, it's hard thing. Uh, it's the hard thing about hard things. Yeah, just to be clear that you're talking about a host analytics CEO, Dave Dave yeah, Kellogg. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Number uh, two. Is there a CEO you're following or studying? Yeah, I mentioned David Cancel from uh, from Drift. Uh, he's a serial op- entrepreneur, a great guy, inspirational leader. Uh, so uh, yeah, I I follow and and talk to to David frequently. And number three. What's your favorite online tool for building your company? So I'd have to say it's HubSpot. It's kind of boring, uh, but the reality is we build a lot of the systems for our company all around HubSpot. It works, it's scalable, and they're a, a good close partner of us too. And number four, how many hours of sleep you get every night? So during the week, I get uh, somewhere between six or seven. It was a little less than six last night. Uh, on the weekend, it's a solid eight. That's great. And then Peter, what's your situation? Married, single, kiddos? I... I uh, blessed to be married for 26 years. Uh, and I have three kids, uh, 22, 21 and, and 18. And how old are you? I'm 54. 54. Take us home. What do you wish your 20 year old self knew? Well, I, there you go. We had a glitch in That's my okay, eyes. Peter. Right what do you wish your 20 year old self knew? I wish my 20 year old self would know not to wait for 30 years to start my first company. Guys, don't wait to start your company. Coming from Plana, again, helping you understand your marketing, budget, forecasting, and planning. They just launched about six months ago. Have about 18 customers paying 200, 300 bucks a month. So call it 4,000, 5,000 bucks in monthly recurring revenue. Has a team of about 12 people right now building this bad boy. Total OPEX, about 100 grand per month. So their net burn is about 90 grand per month. Two million raised, mostly from Peter, from his past successes, uh, who's now looking to take this up into the $100 million range. Peter, we're rooting for you. Thanks for taking us to the top. Thanks, Nathan. One more thing before you go. We have a brand new show every Thursday at 1 p.m. Central. It's called Shark Tank for SaaS. We call it Deal or Bust. One founder comes on, three hungry buyers, they try and do a deal live, and the founder shares back-end dashboards, their expenses, their revenue, 
ARPU, CAC, LTV, you name it, they share it. And the buyers try and make a deal live. It is fun to watch every Thursday, 1 p.m. Central. Additionally, remember, these recorded founder interviews go live. We release them here on YouTube every day at 2 p.m. Central. To make sure you don't miss any of that, make sure you click the subscribe button below here on YouTube, the big red button, and then click the little bell notification to make sure you get notifications when we do go live. I wouldn't want you to miss breaking news in the SaaS world, whether it's an acquisition, a big fundraise, a big sale, a big profitability statement, or something else. I don't want you to miss it. Additionally, if you want to take this conversation deeper and further, we have by far the largest private Slack community for B2B SaaS founders. You want to get in there. We've probably talked about your tool if you're running a company or your firm if you're investing. You can go in there and quickly search and see what people are saying. Sign up for that at nathanlacka.com forward slash slack. In the meantime, I'm hanging out with you here on YouTube. I'll be in the comments for the next 30 minutes. Feel free to let me know what you thought about this episode. And if you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up. We get a lot of haters that are mad at how aggressive I am on these shows, but I do it so that we can all learn. We have to counter those people. We got to push them away. Click the thumbs up below to counter them and know that I appreciate your guys' support. All right, I'll be in the comments. See ya.